Alrighty race fans, welcome to another edition of My Favorite Parts. Well, it's been a little bit since we've dropped a video, so we're going to try to pick up where we left off. Uh, we've talked about tools, if you remember that. Um, we had the press and the pullers and the uh, pinion tool, and then we got into all the different parts of the race car. So we started at the front, uh, talking about the electrics and getting into the motor box um, and magnets. And today, we are going to get into axles and gears, right? Working our way back. And then after that, there'll be another video wrapping up the cars with the tires. And then a third video at some point, we're going to do controllers. All right, so let's jump in. All right, so as you can see, we've got a lot of examples of uh, completed race cars as well as the axles and gears laying on the table. And we're just going to kind of give a quick overview as to what's going on. Um, as a kind of a point of uh, reminiscence, this entire idea of my favorite parts was sparked by one part. And it's kind of weird, but it's this thing right here. This is the Viper Scale Racing Hard Splined Axle. And you're going to say, how is that your favorite part? Well, a number of years ago, back when I was club racing, before Viper was ever thought of, uh, I was racing BSRT, and I used a lot of their stuff, obviously. And one of the problems I always had with, with that product was the axles, in my opinion, weren't very good. Now, I can just hear everybody that loves BSRT, you know, I can just feel the hate right now. but. In reality, they really weren't that good. Uh, his standard steel axles would bend really easy. And at the time, you know, I was unemployed, I was on a budget, and I can remember one particular evening I was uh, testing out a super stock. I had built one and, and was running it through the paces and got maybe three or four laps on the car and crashed out and bent the rear axle. And I just, just, couldn't take it. Um, he did have a titanium rear axle. The problem with these things is that they're soft. And I don't know if you can see that there in the video, but the wear marks where the, where the axle fits into the chassis start to hourglass really bad. And what happens is that part of the axle shrinks in diameter and then the car drops and your handling changes. So that was an expensive part, but it wouldn't hardly last. So when Dan out at Viper came up with a hard splined axle, which is, you know, I think basically a steel axle that they uh, surface harden and then chrome plate, I've yet to bend one of those axles. I've had zero complaints reported from anybody about those axles getting bent. Now, does that mean the axles haven't bent? Well, it could be. We've just not had any complaints. And it really solved a lot of problems and, and really truly became one of my favorite parts. All right, well, moving on from the rear axles, we are going to get into front axles. There's primarily two types for what we do. We've got this O-ring style front axle set and then what I call a fat tire. Um, the O-ring axle set allows you to adjust the front ride height which is an important uh, tuning function, and you can do that with different size O-rings, okay? The fat tire front, you're kind of stuck with the uh, front tire size on these for any particular car, because we really don't have any of these that are the tires that are made in certain sizes, so this is kind of a, a fixed arrangement. All right, moving on to the rear axle, there's a couple examples of some standard factory rear axles. These two right here come out of lifelike cars. One of them is out of an M car, the other is out of a T car. And this is out of a Tyco 440. Now, these axles, as they come from the factory, they're designed to where the factory doesn't have to do any artificial spacing. I mean, they just put these things together. It's got the gear boss in here that grabs the nipple on the pinion and there's no spacers on the back side. So it uh, generally always works all the time. The problem with this setup 
is it can only take so much strain because what you're having to do is all of the side to side stress, okay, is having that little nipple on that pinion has to take all the stress. And, you know, for low downforce factory cars, that's okay, right? But for these higher quality cars that we get up here, even hopped up Mega G's, uh, our Super 7, and then things up into modifieds and then neo cars, you, you just have to have proper spacing on these axles. All right, so we've got a couple of other examples of some custom axle sets laid out here. And this is a rear axle out of a Super 7. This 25 tooth gear, single flanged hubs. We'll get into hubs and tires in the next video. Um, this is an example of a custom axle set with the Gear Saber or T-Boss. And this is an example of an axle set that I sell as a replacement axle set for Mega G and Mega G Plus. It's relying on the nipple of the pinion to hold it in, but when you're trying to simply improve the stock car, it does a, it does a better job than the factory rear axle set because everything is nice and, and true and straight. Um, but to try and put spacers on these and have these be successful in the marketplace is just, you, you can't do it. Um, the chassis has a certain amount of um, shrink and swell. So if I were to put a spacer in here that would uh, hopefully be correct, it might work on my example, but you would get this thing and stick it in the car and it might not work on your example because the shrink rate of this plastic here could be different from chassis to chassis. So for these kind of low-end common play cars, you know, you can get by with this. Um, better quality stuff like my Super 7, we put spacers in here. Okay, to uh, to take the to take the load, and if you got modified cars, okay, like this Wizard, I use a combination of a spacer and the gear boss, and then really really high end stuff, metal gears, and metal gears can be a real big problem to fit. I'm not sure that the video here is, we've got enough time to talk about how to put metal gears into a car. That may come at some other time, but you get a car like this that's got over a pound of downforce, you have to have metal gears. All right, you know, in addition to the uh, front axles that we talked about, the O-ring and the, uh, the fat tire, there is a third option out there. It's more of a high performance uh, part. We'll get into exactly why here in just a second. But that consists of a high quality front axle. You have front hubs that are machined, probably on a screw machine, and then the keepers. So you press a keeper onto the axle, slide that thing on there like such. insert that into the car, then we'll get um, another keeper. What you do, you load that keeper into the hub, put it on a really hard surface. You got your axle threaded through the chassis, and then get something flat and press down, okay? And that gives you your, your lock-in. Now, what makes an independent front-end system important? I personally don't think there's any better or worse rolling resistance between an independent and an O-ring set. What makes this thing really important and working is you get sized front donuts, okay? And they take some kind of rubber material and machine it down. And you 
pop that thing on like that. Okay. Now, I think an independent front end set at the margin helps a car turn. I'm not saying that an O-ring is exactly equal, but the whole idea here is you can raise and lower the front of the car in very, very small increments. Okay, I don't sell these. Um, the demand for this actually is very small. You can probably get these from Lucky Bob's or somebody like that. I think these come from Quicker Engineering. But, you know, I sell independent front end sets. They come with 340 front tires as kind of a standard. And the racer that buys them, he has a tire program and, you know, he can get his own assortment of front tires that suits himself. So that's what is going on there. I may actually figure out how to make an independent front end set out of an O-ring and then you would get a little a little rougher sizing but you would still get the benefit of independent um, rotating fronts but you could still size them for basic car categories. You'd never get them as close as you do with the size donuts. But um, that's how that works. All right, let's uh, jump into axle spacing real quick, guys, and try to get you to where you understand the basics of that. Um, here's a complete axle set, and I'm just going to disassemble it real quick to demonstrate something. So we'll pop this in just like it is. Now, let's look at this. You see how much play that's got? That's a little excessive. Now, you could run it like this, but if this thing were to load into a corner, it's going to push the gear away from the pinion. See, I mean, you can kind of see it skip a little bit. If I hold the motor, you can see that the pinion skips a little bit, and let's listen to it. Little grindy, not too bad. And then we'll put a five thousandths on there. Let's check this again now. You can see it moves a lot less. You don't see as much daylight, but you can still see the axle. You have to have some amount of perceptible side play. If you put the spacers in and you can't wiggle it side to side, you got too much in there. Now let's listen to it. Quiets down just a touch. So that's kind of the basics of spacing the axle. And it's, in, it's really an impossibility to pre-build axle sets with spacers on them. So when you're saying, okay, buy this axle set for Mega G Plus, it might work 80% of the time, okay? And you could get one to where it's too tight, right? So then you've got the guy, he puts it in the car, he's not happy because now you've got too tight of a gear mesh. So that's why on some of this lower end stuff you run the gear boss because that keeps you from being too tight and obviously too loose, but it can only take so much strain. All right, so wrapping it up, we're going to get down to the gears, and on the table we've got uh, some Viper gears here. This is a seven-tooth pinion gear, and we've got a 23-tooth standard gear, a 22-tooth standard gear, and a 23-tooth Mega G, Mega G Plus gear. Now, let's look at the standard profile. So if you look at the thickness of that gear. Okay, just kind of memorize that for a second. And then we get the Mega G Plus. The profile is much thinner. I can hold it steady enough. Maybe we could even do match them up side by side. How about that? Let's try that. Anybody see that? It 
The reason why we have to do that is on the Mega G chassis, there's not a lot of room in that gearbox. And you can see like right up in here, if you had a standard profile gear that was kind of fatter on the outside, it'd start hitting all of this. So the Mega G gear is uh, from Viper specifically designed to go in and uh, make that clearance. Now we get into some other things. We've got super tough gears. That is really a glass filled product. You don't need that truly unless you're running modified. Some people might be able to run it Neo modified, but the Neo cars are so much stress and strain, you really need to go with metal on that. But for most, I'd say 98% of what we use in this hobby, your standard black Delrin gears will give you plenty of service life. Um, if you try to run some of the super tough things in a real light duty application, you're paying more money and really not getting much. Uh, if you're a terrible driver, it might help you a little bit um, in terms of not, you know, constantly keep buying gears. Um, one final thought on things like Super 7 that when I build them, I definitely space these axles. If you crash out and the car come, you know, the axle comes out of the car in a crash, a lot of times this spacer can get moved, okay? Check it before you put it back in the car, okay? Because if you, the spacer's on the outside and you put it back in, I mean, look how much gear slop there is, okay? And then you try to run that and you'll start stripping gears out, right? I had a problem with uh, a customer that I think that happened to them. They started stripping gears out and they probably didn't get the spacer on the inside of the chassis. You do that and then life is good. All right, so let's just um, look about a standard axle, the Viper hard spline axle, and then this BSRT titanium axle. So this standard axle is uh, stainless steel from me, Hardin Creek slot cars. Take a magnet, doesn't stick. Oh, Viper, that's obviously titanium doesn't stick. So stainless steel, steel, and titanium. So on this here, let's try to, you can bend these, okay? Now for Super 7, I've not had anybody wreck a car and bend a rear axle. Uh, just haven't. And that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but this just demonstrates, you know, a standard, what standard steel is. Okay, the hard spline, let's see if we can bend it. I mean, yep, yep, because it's hard steel, it will, it will fracture and actually break before it bends. And that was a lot of stress on that, to do that. All right, so here again, never had anybody wreck a car and bring, you know, Send me a photo, hey, the axle physically broke. That's not ever happened. But that just goes to show you how hard that material is. It will fracture before it breaks. And last and least, the titanium. So you can bend these. This is not, the titanium was mainly for light weight in that class. It's pretty hard, but still, it can bend. But like I say, my favorite part, Viper hard spline axle, it's a super part. Wears well, I don't know what you'd have to do to bend it, but you'd probably break other parts of your car before you broke that axle in two.